Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Career Crush q and I'm Emily Aries, the founder and CEO of Bossed Up, and it's our mission here to help you craft that happy, healthy, and sustainable career path. I'm so glad you're tuning in today because we have a very special guest, the one and only Wendy Davis, hailing from Texas, is joining us today. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Wendy. Thanks for having me, Emily. I'm so excited that I had the pleasure of running into Wendy Davis at the State of Women Summit held by the White House, hosted by the White House just about a month ago now, I think. Yes, a and lot of amazing women were there. So many amazing people were there, and I'm so excited that uh, we can add you to our newest list of badass fans of Bossed Up. Um, <laughs> And I'm really excited to talk with Wendy here. You may know her best for her historic 13-hour-long filibuster that she held as a state senator uh, at the Texas Capitol not too long ago as she stood out in defense of a woman's right to choose, talking about issues and raising national awareness around that important, uh, important right that I think we all value and all of us globally need to value a little bit more, I'd even go to say. Uh, and it's such a timely discussion, considering what's been happening in the national scene as of late. We are in the midst of a presidential election, and as many of you know, at Boss Up, I actually started my career in politics. So I'm excited today, as part of our series, the Career Crush series, we're going to hear from Wendy on how she got to where she is today. Now, a lot of our viewers, as we discussed, Wendy are women who are navigating career transition, who are trying to figure it out, or trying to craft careers with passion and purpose. And it's something that uh, I'm really excited to hear more about from you, especially with this amazing new organization, Deeds Not Words. You are the founder of Deeds Not Words. Why don't we start there? Can you tell us a little bit about that and your latest, uh, latest initiative that's got your focus? Sure. So when my gubernatorial race was over and I looked around for what I was going to do next and I knew I wanted to stay involved in all things gender equality, I tried to figure out what the best place was for me to fit in. And it seemed to make a lot of sense because I had a nice, um, very privileged to have audience with young women around the country. And I was asked a question repeatedly by young women as I talked to them, which is some form of the, what do we do? Um, people who are passionate and really informed and wanting very much to make a difference, but needing a way to connect. So Deeds Not Words is a beginning. We have um, a long way to go before it's doing exactly what I want to see it doing, but it is our attempt to answer that question for young women to be able to come to our website to read our weekly newsletter and to find ways that they can get involved in the world of gender equality and helping us to move that forward. I love it and it's such a great gateway into activism which I think is something that isn't a super easy door to find, right? Yeah. I think unless you were born and raised around a very political kitchen table, politics can sometimes seem very combative and ugly and unfriendly and frankly not a place that I want to necessarily bring my time and energy and attention. But I think the more women, especially women leaders, that we see changing the game uh, in politics and maybe even changing the game at the highest levels this year, uh, the more we can change that reality, that status quo of what it means to be an activist. And I just love how Deeds Not Words is creating that on-ramp into activism for so many young women. Thanks. I like that phrase. I'm going to use that myself. <laughs> Please do. I mean, we need to talk more about it because I think what you're doing is really important. And it's deedsnotwords.org where people can learn more about that. Dot right? com, actually. Oh, okay. Dot com. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, let's take it back to the beginning, Wendy. Can you tell us how on earth you got to where you are today in terms of the road you took to get there. I think a lot of us at Bossed Up have at one point or another felt like we were in a moment of reinvention mm -hmm. where we were on a path. It seemed like there was no way to get off it. You know, it seemed like things yeah. were set in stone. Inertia was pushing us along. And whatever your background is, whatever kind of privilege you come from or don't come from, um, I think there are times in everyone's lives when we're like, how did I get here? 
yeah. and change course. To me, your story is a series of reinventions and pivot points like that. So take us through the, the early stages of how, how you got started in, in politics and activism. Well, I did not, Emily, come from a political family at all. We did not sit around the kitchen table and talk right. politics. And in fact, I was one of those young women that I'm trying to reach right now. I was very, um, very much a struggling single mom. I was doing everything I could just to keep the rent paid and keep us moving forward. And I think a lot of young women who find themselves in that place really struggle with how they're going to move up and out of it and to be doing something that feels a little more meaningful than just survival, you know? Um, but the lesson I learned from that survival really created who I am. It created my core in terms of what it is I care about and what I'm working on now. So the first thing I would say to young women is, Spend some time thinking about your own trajectory and what matters to you. Like what, what created the person that you are and how can you give back to that particular part of you? When I finally made my way to law school after quite a struggle, starting with community college and thank God for Pell Grants and other kinds of uh, affordable college means that I had available to me back then, I found in, in law school something that I really enjoyed doing. I worked for a legal services center. It was back in the early 90s when the AIDS, HIV epidemic was really burgeoning. At the time, there were no good pharmaceutical alternatives for treating the disease, and it essentially meant for people that they had to get their affairs in order. And so I helped people do that, and I saw and confronted every day the world of discrimination against their partners, against recognizing that relationship and the legitimacy of it. And when I graduated from that program, I found myself um, moving forward into a world that I thought I wanted to be in, but it turns out it wasn't the right fit for me at all. I went to work for a big law firm. I was doing corporate defense work. And I was not happy, was not happy at all. And I didn't really know what to do next or how to move in a different direction. And it really was my uh, first step in the advocacy world that created for me that gateway, that on-ramp that you were talking about a moment ago that kind of opened up a lifelong um, involvement and love of working to change policy. And that started you know, just by getting involved in my neighborhood about something I was mad about, going to City Hall and complaining about it, and then deciding that maybe I could do that job. So I think that's such an important point I want to highlight for a moment, which is that you busted your butt to get your education. You took not the traditional route to make it happen, too, but you made it happen. And then there you are at the finish line, landing this big corporate attorney job. What is supposed to feel like success, mm -hmm. all of a sudden feels like that hollow, short-term, unsustainable success. That, and yeah. that, to me, is like, oh my goodness, that is something I think a lot of us feel and a lot of us face and a lot of us come to Boss Up to figure out what to do from there. Mm -hmm. Because success is what you're talking about, which is getting clear on what you really believe in and how you really want to spend your time on this earth. Uh, and so so getting mad, I think, is actually a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always feel that way when we're in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's such a great point. I also want to just quickly remind our viewers, you can ask questions live as well. I've got Twitter off to the side here. So for all of our wonderful viewers who are tuning in, use that hashtag career crush so that I can follow along with you and we can keep in touch. You can also tweet at me at bossedup.org and at Wendy Davis to keep this conversation going. So Wendy, what happened from there? You first got involved in politics in your neighborhood. Then what? How do you, how do you end up on the ticket for the first woman running for governor in Texas since the 90s, right? I mean, how yeah. did that happen? Well, it wasn't something I planned. I was in my fifth term, my ninth year on the Fort Worth City Council. I loved my time there. I loved local service because you really are working directly with the people whose lives you're impacting. 
And I had decided that I wasn't going to run again. I thought I'd probably go back into more of the private workforce. And in that moment in time, some community leaders came to me along with some really key political strategists who said, there's this Senate seat. And yes, it's a Republican seat. And yes, it's held by a longtime Republican incumbent. But we think there's a vulnerability there. And we think that if we can make everything go our way, we can win. And they wanted someone like me who'd been in office, who had worked with people in a nonpartisan role, and who had come to know Republicans and Democrats alike and was respected and liked by them in the community. They knew it was going to take some cross-vote appeal, but obviously a lot of work, too, to get our base out. And it just so happened it was 2008 when President Obama was on the ticket, which really excited and motivated particularly the African-American voting base in the Senate district that I represented. And we pulled off a, a great upset. I loved, I loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, I, I miss being in the Texas Senate, even though it was, you know, almost always fighting a losing battle. It just felt like it made a difference to be there fighting the fight. Yeah, and you made the most of that upset, I have to say. So I think it's so important that, uh, that we take a moment to acknowledge the role of being asked to run. We should yeah. all be asking more women. I can't help but think if she should run a great here in D.C. We've got a lot of um, great support from them and their, their colleagues here are friends of mine. Right, the power of asking a woman to step into that role of seeing her leadership potential, validating that that leadership identity, um, and then seeing what happens. And then, of course, the courage to say, yes, I'm going to do it, is also part of the equation. But man, did you make the most of that opportunity, right? I think your filibuster um, is really what's shown a national spotlight on these really critical issues of reproductive rights that have been under attack in state state houses across the nation in particular, but we even saw, uh, you know, that challenge go all the way up to the highest courts in our nation. How did we run? I know, amazing. How does it feel? I mean, I think you were asked by CNN this question. I saw you up there, but how on earth does it feel looking back at that, that probably what I have to say must be a whirlwind since uh, your sneakers went viral, right, on the Senate floor to now, having seen that uh, amazing Supreme Court decision come down? Well, uh, you know, when you look at that journey, what you see, to me, what's most important about it was that so many people refused to give up, right? First of all, it started with people showing up at the Texas Capitol. That day would not have become that day if the thousands of people who showed up had decided to stay home. And it was really because they weighed in. They literally used their voices as um, what was referred to as an unruly mob to get the filibuster successfully past the midnight deadline. And that sparked in a lot of people who were there that day and who were watching online the understanding of the power of our voices when we weigh in and when we say we've had enough. And it then, of course, was just the beginning of a three-year journey of people like Amy Hagstrom Miller, who is the CEO and uh, founder of Whole Woman's Health, which was the named plaintiff in that case. She and her staff, I get chills literally thinking about the work that they engaged in to get us where we, where we got. And of course, the Center for Reproductive Rights and NARAL and Planned Parenthood and so many others it was a combined effort of people who said, we're not going to give up, we're right. going to keep fighting, and who were willing to spend the time and the energy and the emotion to get us where, where we yeah. ultimately found ourselves. I love that. It speaks to resiliency, right, and yeah. just the importance of grit. It's obviously yeah. fun to look at the highlight reel, and I think that's what social media makes all of our lives look like nowadays, but it's mm -hmm. really you know, putting in that, that sweat equity and the elbow yeah. grease into pushing something over the top, it gives me a lot of hope for where we are with Black Lives Matter, where we are with police brutality, where we are with a lot of these seemingly intractable, yeah. scary issues, um, which is start start raising those voices and moving those feet and demanding in, in a resilient and persistent way real significant change. So. Absolutely. 
You got me all fired up here all, all over again, Wendy. I love it. So I want to take this in a, in a slightly different direction for just a moment here because part of what we talk a lot about at Bossed Up is burnout. Yeah. And in particular, this, this challenge for personal resilience over the course of one's career path, especially affecting those advocates in the, the social justice space or people who feel like martyrs for their work. Yeah. Which is a tricky thing, right? Because I'm all about people, you know, being passionate and, and pursuing purpose driven work. But how do we balance that with our own personal sustainability so that we are actually in this fight for the long haul and don't burn out um, trying to trying to spread ourselves out too thin. So I guess the yeah. question is how have you managed to to with all of you've got going on as a single parent, the the journey that you've been on both before and after entering politics, um, and especially after your gubernatorial race didn't quite go the way we'd all hoped, mm -hmm. how do you bounce back? How do you stay strong and how do you keep fighting? I've learned one skill that has really helped me in my life, and I call it compartmentalization. Um, I am really good at allowing myself to set aside from my mind the difficult challenges ahead and the day-to-day -day work that we're all involved in. When I spend time with my family, I'm with my family. I really try to be unplugged and I try very much to do things that I know keep me mentally healthy. We all have you know, different things, right? For me, it's making sure I get outside, I run or I'm on my bike or something just to work up that sweat and clear yeah. the cobwebs from my head. Totally. And I, you know, I just try to, I take care of myself and I take time to do fun things at the end of the day, instead of sitting at my computer working at 11 o'clock, I'll watch an episode of Veep or, you know, just something to kind of lighten the load and have a little bit of fun. I think we have to find time every single day to do something just for ourselves, decompress a bit. And I know there are days when it's impossible to do that, but make up for it when you can. I travel a lot right now and mm -hmm. I find the greatest challenge with traveling, you know, sometimes five different states in five days yeah. is fitting in time to do anything pleasurable. And so some days you can't, but when you can make up for it, please do. And, and understand that it's just as important as any of the work that you're doing, because if you're not mentally healthy and happy, you will burn out and you won't be able to commit yourself to something that you care a great deal about. I think that's such a good point and it also reminds me of where you started from and how getting out of that sort of rat race of survival mode mm -hmm. is the only thing that enables us to actually invest in our long-term success. And obviously it's not just about leaning in or like you know, doing it ourselves, obviously we need public policy to keep up with, with the modern American family unit and the modern American worker and get with it with some serious reform that can help us as individuals, businesses or organizations and the government all making it easier so that we don't just have to scrape by and survive um, so that we can, I think, invest in our long-term sustainability as a country as well. So I guess... One of my final questions for you is, what do you hope to see? What are you hoping for the future? Not just with, uh, with you and deeds, not words, but for women in this country. If you could, you know, if you had a laundry list for the next president to tackle, uh, yeah. you know, or, or really a vision for where you want to see uh, women in the United States go next, what is in that sort of wish list? Well, my first wish on that list is to elect the first woman president in this country. <laughs> um, and I expect that we're going to see her, if we do elect her to that office, we're going to see her do what we've watched her do in other important offices that she's held. Mm -hmm. Her Secretary of State role is a really good example, creating that ambassadorship for women and girls around the world and understanding that there really did need to be this unique position created and a specific amount of attention given to the role of women and girls in, in this world. And I feel confident she'll do that for the country as well. And that we're going to see her 
be more than a friend on the issues that we confront. We're going to see her be a champion and to put some key people in place who will help her champion those things. We have a lot of challenges to confront in this country, uh, particularly if you are female and a person of color. Yeah. And I think the intersection of those issues is tremendously important and we're really going to need to see some key emphasis put on that. But too often we talk about them as though they're completely right. separate things. Right. So I, I hope we, we begin to tackle that in a much more strategic way and we look all the way at the root of so much of where we see problems pop up in our country and we systemically provide the kind of support that people need to see to realize opportunity. Yeah. For women, those are really unique and particularly again when you're talking about women of color who are facing unique challenges, mm -hmm. making sure we have affordable child care, quality child care, mm -hmm. making sure that we are funding pre-K programs across this country so that women can return to work knowing not only that their children are being well cared for but they're launching their own educations in a really positive and proactive way, obviously cutting back, stopping, reversing every bit of ground that we've lost in the world of reproductive rights because right. we cannot own our economic destiny if we cannot control when and whether we have children. Mm -hmm. These are some of the key issues that I think we confront in addition, obviously, to increasing wages across um, that lower wage earning sector yeah. of our economy and making sure that women are paid equally and that they don't have to worry about losing their job if they have to take care of a, a sick child at home. Yeah. The laundry list is long. It, it is, is long. Yeah. It's important. <laughs> It is a long list, but I'm fired up and I'm just so inspired at, at really, I think your story is the American story, right? Your story is so indicative of what can happen when you persevere, when you, you fight, you fought for your education and then you put it to good use on behalf of people who really need help out there. Um, and I think that's important and that's inspiring and what I love even more is that you are about getting your self-care in mm -hmm. <laughs> so that I know you're going to be still fighting for years to come and you're not burning out anytime soon either, which is a beautiful role model type thing to set, I think, for a lot of us in our early parts of our career, like how? How does this work? How does this even happen? I can barely take care of my dog. How do I even <laughs> having a, a real, not fur baby, but a real baby? Right. right. <laughs> Well, thank you, Wendy. Is there anything else that you would love to share with our audience? And audience, tweet them at me. If you got a question for Wendy, hit me up right now on Twitter. Use that hashtag career crush or at bossedup.org or at Wendy Davis, and we'll make sure we get it in here. But anything more that you can share with us about deeds, not words, or, or how ladies who are tuning in can start to get involved? I guess the final thing I want to say, and Deeds Not Words can be a launch pad for this, um, but there are other obviously launch pads as well. Take risks. Mm -hmm. That can be obviously the scariest thing for all of us. It's one of the reasons that we don't see as many women as we would like stepping up and running for office. I have not always succeeded when I've taken a risk, but I've never regretted a risk that I've taken and I've certainly seen risks pay off as well so bet on yourself believe in yourself take risks and you'll see the reward in that you truly will I love it I love it I am so honored to have spent this uh, career crush Q&A with you Wendy Davis thank you so much for tuning in and thanks to all of our viewers who tuned in today and for those who are watching on YouTube for days weeks months years to come uh, check out deedsnotwords.com to learn more about Wendy's latest initiatives. And you can find me here every Wednesday, 1 o'clock Eastern, with incredible guests like Wendy Davis talking about their career paths. So thanks again for joining me, Wendy. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Have a great right, afternoon. Have a great rest of your week and keep bossing. <laughs> Bye.